Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad studios. Today we'll be talking about this very important uh, visit of the Iranian uh, president, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Raisi, who is in um, Russia. And interestingly, after 2017, this is the uh, first president of Iran who is visiting uh, Kremlin. And he had very productive meeting uh, with the Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin. And they discussed so many issues, including the G JCPOA, the FP5 plus one issue, plus on top um, the issue regarding Syria, Middle East, and uh, so much more. As uh, the uh, Iranian president very categorically mentioned that there are no limits for expanding ties with uh, Russia. So a very positive sign. And having said that, their uh, relationship has really significantly improved with the uh, Chinese also. Now, what sort of uh, deal is going to be signed out there? What sort of a support will they be getting uh, from the Russians? Uh, that is pretty important. And I also uh, remind you that uh, the gentleman I'm talking about, Mr. Raisi, he is going to be most likely the next supreme leader of Iran. So you can well imagine how important this particular uh, person is. Now, before I introduce you to our panelists, and we start off the program. Our production team has prepared a report. Let's watch that first. Iran's recent foreign policy engagements are making it a crucial participant of the emerging new Cold War and global bloc politics between the United States, China and Russia. In this regard, China's recent reaffirmation of its opposition to the unilateral sanctions of the United States against Iran in a meeting where Chinese and Iranian foreign ministers announced the launch of a 25 years cooperation agreement was a proof of a clear defiance of both nations from United States unilateral approaches. In this meeting, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi backed efforts to revive the 2015 nuclear deal between major powers and Iran while declaring the United States primarily responsible for the ongoing difficulties with Iran. Moreover, Russian President Vladimir Putin on 19 January 2022 hosted his Iranian counterpart Ibrahim Raisi and hailed the cooperation between two countries on various international issues. Ibrahim Raisi in this meeting said that Iran has no limits for expanding ties with Russia and ties will be permanent and strategic. Vladimir Putin also said that it is very important for Russia to know Iran's opinion on joint comprehensive plan of action. Recently, the United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken in an interview on United States public radio stations NPR stated that there are only a few weeks left to save the 2015 Iran nuclear deal before Tehran's advancement will become too difficult to reverse. On the other hand, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei signaled in a speech that holding talks and negotiating with the enemy at certain junctures does not mean surrendering. Despite the recent bitter exchanges between the United States and Iran, Biden administration and Tehran have softened their initial stances as the negotiations on joint comprehensive plan of action have progressed in Vienna. Now to talk about it, we have with us in our studio on my right is Nasser Ali Khan Saab, a former ambassador, senior analyst. So thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. And we have with us uh, Dr. Kaab Malik, joining us from uh, London, expert on foreign affairs. Pleasure to have you, Kaab. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll also be talking to Mr. Anwar Iqbal, who's a senior journalist based in Washington, D.C., United States of America. And he'll be joining us in a few minutes. But let me start off from you, Nasir Ali Khan Saab. Uh, Iranian president's visit to Russia. Now, perhaps one of the statements which was very encouraging uh, when we heard the Iranian president saying that uh, there are no limits. It's, it could be anything. I mean, they are really looking forward for really uh, mending, first of all, uh, their current status of their relationship and also improving it over a period of time. And at the same time, if you look at the kind of uh, statements that are being issued from the Chinese side, and they also, in fact, vowed that they'll be spending somewhat around $400 billion in the next 25 years in Iran. So, sir, the geostrategic position of Iran is being used here. The support from the Iranians as far as the softer belly of Russia is concerned, especially the Muslim world, and on top, <laughs> The most important factor is J.C. Poirce, the P5 plus 1 formula that ended because Donald Trump unilaterally took a decision and he backed out. Let's start off from there, sir. The importance and the significance of this visit. Well, you know, Russian-Iranian ties um, are now quite old in the sense that earlier uh, when there was pressure on uh, Iran because of its nuclear policy, uh, Russia and China were the two 
P5 members that supported them often in the Security Council. Uh, apart from that, in the near past, we've had uh, the cooperation in Syria, one of the statements that came out of this meeting that we are discussing tonight, uh, is that uh, they uh, were talking about the cooperation and the words they used uh, in supporting the Syrian government against uh, international terrorism. So that is another area of cooperation. Apart from that, uh, for many, many years now, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard is, is given tens of billions of dollars worth of contracts within Iran. And a lot of these contracts have been subcontracted to the Russians and the Chinese. And so this relationship is, is not a, a very recent one and it has never had uh, uh, any serious problems in the past. Now because uh, of the JCPOA, which is essentially the Iran nuclear deal that was finally signed towards the end of 2015, uh, which from which the Americans uh, retracted in, in uh, 2018, that is uh, perhaps a cause for concern, not just for Iran because it doesn't want to come under uh, strong sanctions anymore, but also for the European Union and other trade partners. Right now, the three countries that uh, have the maximum support for Iran are probably Russia, China, and Turkey. But they also have strong economic ties with uh, Italy and France and Germany, uh, and of course, India. And therefore, they are now looking uh, for partners who will plead their case and save them in case anything goes wrong from very, very strong sanctions. So that is one of the main uh, reason uh, for these talks. Apart from that, they also uh, talked about a deep strategic partnership with Russia uh, and, and have given a written uh, statement uh, in, in terms of what they want to discuss and how they want to move this forward. There is also talk that they are interested in buying SU-35 yeah. fighter jets as well as the S-400, uh, it's a missile defense system. So you know these ties are uh, right now being further strengthened and then of course they talked about better trade and then there was a discussion on the concerns that Iran has vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan because there are about 2.5 million refugees still there and they also have a drug problem through Absolutely. Iran because yeah. of Afghanistan. Uh, in the past, they haven't had great relations with the Taliban government, but now they are very keen. They've opened up. To move forward, yes. Now, uh, coming to you, uh, Dr. Akab Malik, a couple of important points. The latest uh, development regarding Yemen, there were again airstrikes by the Saudis on Yemen, in which, again, they believe that a um, couple of targets were hit. But when you talk to the people uh, out there and the... Houthi point of view is very different. They believe that the civilians, including the children and the women, were killed in that airstrike. Earlier that day, if you remember, there was a strike in uh, Abu Dhabi in which three people were killed, one Pakistani, two Indians. And the Houthis, in fact, uh, accepted the responsibility uh, of that drone strike. Now, what I'm saying is that things seem to be settling down in Syria. But another very important front <coughs> is wide open. And that is the issue of Yemen, sir. Pretty important, pretty significant, and very alarming also. Now, do you think that uh, when you talk about a country like Iran, historical perspective, uh, the current uh, issue of sanctions, the Sipoa, Syrian issue, this issue in uh, Yemen, uh, earlier than that, if you look at the Americans, forget about the uh, backing out of uh, the US uh, from the JCPOA agreement. But, sir, we have seen General. Uh, Soleimani being killed, another top-notch uh, uh, Iranian scientist was also assassinated. So in this perspective, where do you see Iran now sort of moving? As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, I think uh, Iran has its own regional concerns and they center upon um, 
their competition with Saudi Arabia, fundamentally, and Saudi Arabian allies in the local region, the Gulf area, for example, UAE. So I think Iran uh, is fundamentally uh, going to be challenging them on many fronts. I mean, Yemen is one of the major fronts um, when the Saudis brought a war to Yemen to not allow the, uh, the Houthis to take power. Uh, Iran supported the Houthis, but that wasn't just uh, a support for uh, a particular group. It was also a religious uh, um, responsibility. They felt that they had to do with their fellow Shias in, in Yemen also. And I think uh, Yemen is, is, a, is a, a big picture, um, has an historical significance as far as the Al Saud family is concerned. Because before uh, Saudi Arabia came into being um, at the end of the uh, First World War, there were different tribes where the Yemeni tribes and the, the South tribes of Faisal uh, was were one of the leaders of the, uh, the, the Al Saud tribe at the time. And they were in contention with certain areas. And the Yemenis were always the fighters in that area and contested um, um, tribal or territorial claims in different areas. And that's just uh, propagated to this point uh, about 100 years later. Um, but as far as Iran is concerned, they, I feel that they will continue to counter Saudi Arabia's advancements in uh, the Arab countries and different areas to support the Shia minorities in different countries, but also that they want to reduce Saudi Arabian uh, geostrategic or at least regional influence in that area. Um, this is in the region. Um, its, its relationship with uh, Russia is something else. Uh, the relationship with Re Russia is primarily uh, global in reach, primarily be to offset um, United States pressure, sanction pressure to provide to uh, sol sol consolidate the relationship between Russia and Iran over the forthcoming years, especially because Russia is seen as a direct threat to uh, American and Western interests in Europe. Um, and as a result, Iran feels that it needs to strengthen that bond. But as the previous speaker said, this relationship has been pretty strong for some time now, especially in Syria, uh, where uh, Iran and the Russians have supported Bashar al-Assad throughout the civil war in direct opposition of Western interests there and in direct opposition of Saudi interests there. So, so you can see this continuing. I don't think this is going to stop. The same goes for Lebanon, uh, Palestinian territories, wherever Iran feels that it can put a place and instigate opposition against Saudi interests or Saudi and allied interests, then it will do so. I think it's a, it's a contest between two regional powers that's not going to stop it any time soon. And it's been going on for a long time. Uh, since, since Khalid bin Walid uh, defeated the Persians 1400 years ago through guerrilla warfare. However, the caveat being that Persia had been in constant warfare for a thousand years before that and felt weak. And as a result, the, uh, as far as the, uh, the Persians were concerned, they let the Arabs in. They want to counter this influence and they want to maintain a certain degree of dominance in the region. And that influence amongst other countries is necessary. Their linkages with China, for example, and linkages with Russia would enhance their stature amongst other local countries in, in the region. I think that's very important for them, but also geostrategically. Um, and uh, Afghanistan, as you mentioned, uh, originally and for um, sectarian reasons, uh, an opposition to the Sunni uh, hardline Taliban, the, the Iranians were always in opposition until recently they felt, especially because the Russians are becoming a bridge between Iran and um, the Taliban, that they're going to try to find favor with the Taliban, primarily because also the Taliban are seen as opponents of the U.S. as well, as they have been for many mm -hmm. years. So trying to inculcate a certain relationship, a strategic relationship in the future, we can foresee that happening. However, having said that, everybody is waiting for Iraq, uh, Afghanistan to settle down and see which direction the Taliban takes. So as far as Iran is concerned, it is been waiting for a long time to reduce its own sanctions the severity of, the severity of sanctions have been very harsh. The joint comprehensive plan of action, the nuclear deal, in other words, has uh, been reinvigorated since last year uh, with meetings in April, I think, last year and continuing to occur. 
and there's there's a certain mellowing out, especially because of the Biden administration. But there's no guarantee that that will uh, erupt in something favorable towards Iran at this moment in time. The United States feels that Iran needs to do so much more as far as its uh, uranium activities are concerned or the nuclear activities are concerned and to do those before any form of agreement can occur again. Now, despite so I the think fact that the Iranians really believe that uh, this deal is, uh, I mean, it's good for them if things are sorted out, but uh, they believe that this is purely uh, for the uh, medical purposes and uh, not uh, for, uh, and they don't have any intent to, to develop a nuclear weapon. But, uh, Ambassador Saab, a couple of points here, sir. Number one, the recent development, let's say, uh, between the GCC countries and Israel, sir, in particular UAE. And now things are also settling down with uh, Qatar on various fronts between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Obviously, Saudi Arabia is a dominating power out there, sir. So that development and then the stance of the Iranians and their tilt towards China and, and Russia. Very open, I mean, if you look at the alignment, very open uh, strategy. Uh, you talk about Pakistan, sir, uh, whether we like it or we don't, whether we say that we do not believe in camp politics, but, sir, the tilt is very obvious. Uh, you talk about India, they are trying to keep a balance between the Americans and the Russians. The Russians have been the oldest allies. So this region and the Central Asia versus the Middle East, where the trends have changed, what sort of a development do you see, sir, happening in the next five to ten years when you see that kind of an influence of the Israelis out there as well, sir? And they have said that, you know, if something happens to UAE, we'll come for their defense. Well, as far as the Israelis and the Saudis getting uh, closer to each other is concerned, uh, there are two factors. When uh, this Iran nuclear deal was uh, signed uh, in 2015, uh, obviously uh, Saudi Arabia felt uh, slighted in a way and, and was wary of the fact uh, that uh, the United States may be getting closer to Iran. Uh, as a result, uh, it decided to have closer ties with Israel because Israel is the mortal enemy even today of Iran. Uh, Iran uh, refuses even to talk to them because they don't recognize them as a country. Uh, but when you talk about this whole belt uh, facing in a sense each other, it all starts in my opinion from a change in US policy vis-a-vis -vis India. Uh, the, the United States decided that India has to be our future strategic partner as a bulwark against uh, the Chinese, uh, as a result of which a lot of people uh, went from India to make closer ties with friends of the United States in, in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. So it started to look like a block from India all the way to the Especially Saudi when you Peninsula. see the Prime Minister being awarded all the top-notch civilian awards, to, yes. Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, UAE. And, and, and it, it's all the way from here to Israel. Mm. Uh, as a counter to this, I think it's only natural that there will be another alliance formed on the north side. Uh, Pakistan obviously had certain concerns after having been uh, a very strong ally from the 1950s and having gone through thick and thin. Um, Pakistan felt that uh, it was unfair that uh, India was given certain concessions like, for instance, in the nuclear suppliers group and, you know, uh, we, were, we were treated unfairly in some sense. But uh, as far as Iran is concerned, yes, as Dr. Malik po pointed out, uh, I'm afraid this is a natural rivalry within the Gulf. The Iranians call it the Persian Gulf, the, the Arabs call it the Arabian Gulf. See. And this uh, is definitely going to continue. Iran has influence in uh, Bahrain, uh, in Kuwait, in Syria, and of course Yemen to some extent. Uh, and then uh, the Saudis obviously want to counter uh, this influence. So as far as I can see, uh, despite everything, uh, the rivalry is going to continue. And uh, as you said, uh, Iran is going to get increasingly uh, closer to Russia and China. Uh, but another factor that needs to be pointed out, the European Union was not at all in favor Absolutely. Of, Absolutely. Of, of doing away with this uh, agreement. 
and they are keen in, in, in uh, increasing their economic ties uh, with Iran. So they, in, at this point, uh, can be a facilitator and a bridge builder between uh, the Americans and the Iranians because until recently, Iran was not willing to talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the Americans on the yeah, JCPOA exactly. issue. Mm -hmm. So this is unfortunately a, a, a situation where, you know, several powers from either side of the Gulf are going to be aligned against each other. Interestingly, sir, uh, when you talk about Iran, a country full of resources, as far as energy is concerned, gas, fuel, petrol, precious metals. And on top, sir, we've also learned that about $200 billion that has been frozen, and that is the money of Iranians abroad. Then you talk about $400 billion, uh, you know, a, a promise that has been made to the Iranians that the Chinese are going to invest in the next 25 years. And 25 years, uh, I mean, as you talk about 2.5 decades, I mean, that doesn't, uh, that can change uh, Iran. But sir, now uh, the real issue is that this gentleman who is the current uh, president, Ibrahim Raisi, he most likely is going to become the next uh, supreme leader. So this man has a lot of power, has a lot of support. And so the kind of uh, you know reaction we have earlier witnessed uh, when uh, the uh, general, the top general of Iran was uh, killed in a drone strike sir, in Iraq, the um, Iranians fight missiles on the so uh, American, uh, you know, certain bases mm -hmm. in, in Iraq. Oh so yes. the point is that, you know, uh, you, 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 you know that Iran means business and they won't back out because historically, if you look at them, I mean, they have always been very challenging in that regard. But sir, the current situation, again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about the GCC countries versus Iran on one side, sir. A lot of support for the GCC countries uh, is also mustered by the uh, Israelis. And also, sir, let's go back a little, sir. Let's go back uh, into history when uh, the President of the United States of America was Mr. Obama. And he was, I, I think he did, he did a brilliant job when this uh, particular deal, Jesse Power, was concluded. But, sir, uh, the reaction of Mr. Netanyahu was interesting because he went, met the Republicans out there abused their own president on their soil and came back and he clearly opposed this deal. And eventually what happened, Mr. Donald Trump unilaterally took a decision, reversed it. Do you see some sort of a breakthrough now, sir? Because according to certain very senior officials, Mr. Joe Biden has also hinted that if certain issues are taken care of, yes, we can restore it. Yes, I think... I think Iran, you see, when we talk about all the natural resources in Iran, uh, let's take the example of the Iran-Pakistan-India pipeline, which is a gas pipeline supposed to come from the Paris and surrounding um, gas fields. This could have been a major, major uh, advantage for, for Iran's economy. Uh, then you're talking about the oil uh, we must realize that the, due to the uh, years-long sanctions, a lot of the oil infrastructure is, is, uh, very, is, is quite derelict. Uh, the sort of production that they can achieve, they require Western technology. The new technology, uh, basically, yes, sir. Yes, to, to do mm -hmm. that. A and so uh, the reason that, uh, you know, like you were talking about the frozen funds, after 2015, uh, some of those funds were unfrozen. And that is what is giving Iran an incentive to come back to the table because they do not want those sanctions. It's primarily because of the economy. Uh, in, in 1980, when they had this war with Iraq on the Shatr al-Arab, uh, it lasted eight years and it devastated mm. uh, the economy. Over a million people died. Uh, and it was after that war in 1988, when, when Iran finally signed Resolution 598 at the UN Security Council, that the policy, the foreign policy of Iran took a major turn. Why? Because of the economy. And that is when they started looking towards uh, neighboring countries and potential uh, partners, uh, ec uh, you know, trading partners and things like that. So it is basically the economy uh, that has a bearing on all these things. Uh, of course, when we talk about uh, Israel, uh, there is this policy of Iran, 
uh, that uh, they do not recognize the country and that they will support uh, the Because sir, the Israelis believe that the Iranian proxy is really hurting them. Look at this incident last year, what we all witnessed, the Beirut bombing, sir. Unbelievable, almost 150 people died in that. Why was that so? Because they believe that Hezbollah was storing explosives there. Whatever that material was, that's a separate debate. But boom, that's what the Israelis can do. True. And but perhaps uh, that's the way forward because, you know, I remember, sir, when Mr. Reisani uh, was the president prior to the gentleman uh, who is visiting Russia, uh, he went to Italy, he also went to France. And so, honestly speaking, that was the time when we were all talking about that uh, sanctions would be lifted. They have a lot of money in their kitty. So he was ready to order for 500 uh, of these airliners, few from Italy, few from France, and then he also wanted to order to Boeing. Just imagine the kind of mindset he had, expansion, tourism. Yes. So that is a major threat for countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia or perhaps Oman, isn't it? Well, I, I personally believe that if Iran grew economically into a major power, uh, it would benefit the whole region. Uh, because, you know, as I was talking about the IPI, for instance, uh, Pakistan could benefit a great deal from that pipeline, not only because we can get a regular supply of uh, relatively inexpensive gas, but also that we will be a transit route to India which is, again, apart from the uh, transit fees that we can get, uh, there, uh, there starts to be a certain reliance of India uh, upon Pakistan in that sense, once you start to rely on the gas that goes through here. So it's all about the... Then economy. nobody was going to blow those pipes. No, but personally, <laughs> personally, I believe uh, that uh, a strong, economically strong mm. Iran, a vibrant economy in Iran, uh, tourism, people coming and going, is going to be very beneficial for the uh, whole region, not least of which uh, will be an advantage to Pakistan because our link uh, to Europe, you know, we've so tried we have the best to send network a train. Of gas, uh, pipelines in Pakistan. Not only One that, the West. we are talking about trade routes via train, which is much faster, cheaper, you know, quicker. Of course, there are problems of the track different the gauge. gauges of the track. But there is no reason that if there is peace and there's good, e strong economy there uh, and there aren't sanctions, uh, that our goods can reach Europe much faster. Much faster, absolutely. What a perfect... Uh, actually, this is the route. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, one more thing before I uh, move on to our next guest, Umar Karim Saab, who's an expert on Middle East. Uh, one important factor, sir, is that uh, if you look at uh, Iran uh, as, as, as a country which can join Asia uh, to Europe, I mean, I think that is something which is really important and they've developed the infrastructure also. And I still remember, sir, Mr. Ahmadi Najad was the, prime, uh, was the president in 2013, last couple of months of the People's Party's government, sir, when Mr. Uh, Asif Ali Zardari being the president went to Iran, sir, when this uh, deal was done. And the Iranians were offering $250 million to Pakistan to develop that sort of an infrastructure within Pakistan. Unfortunately, nothing happened. We didn't hear much because a lot of pressure was on Pakistan. And then Nawaz Sharif Saab came in and, you know, True. everything was reversed. Now we have with us um, Omar Karim Saab, expert on Middle East. Assalamu alaikum ji. Wa alaikum assalam. Omar Saab, thank ji. you very much for uh, talking to PTV World. Now, since we're talking about the uh, geopolitics in the Middle East, we're also talking about the very important visit of the Iranian president uh, to Moscow. And uh, as we say that Iran is in the uh, transitioning uh, the world order. How do you see this? It's a, it's a very important visit because uh, uh, there have been um, lately tensions between the U.S. and uh, Russia. They have been on the increase. And uh, definitely Moscow uh, is a very important geopolitical player uh, uh, with regards to Iranian neighborhood as well. Uh, especially if you see the recent developments uh, between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia. Uh, so that's another theater where Iran and uh, Russia both have stakes. Uh, they both have stakes uh, in Afghanistan. So I think there is a long list of uh, issues at the table between the two sides. And uh, also both sides will be talking about uh, the possibility of uh, revival of the JCPOA because Russia is also... Uh, part of the extended uh, 
uh, you can say deliberations uh, uh, in, in this regard. So I think this is a very, very extremely important uh, visit, specifically also because of President Raisi, because President Raisi now, in a way, <coughs> his uh, presidency makes uh, uh, all the ruling quarters in Iran roughly on the uh, same page. Uh, so before there were uh, relative tensions or relative, you can say, uh, differences between uh, the, you can say, the presidency and supreme leader or uh, uh, revolutionary guards. But now uh, it seems that uh, all are on a similar line and uh, political alignment. So that enhances further uh, the importance of this visit. Do you think this visit can also pay a way uh, for the JCPOA? Uh, uh, they can play, they can uh, influence Iran. Russians were uh, always very supportive of the idea. So were the Chinese and even the Europeans. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, all of them uh, are supportive of this uh, idea. And uh, I think also Russia and China, uh, probably they have the biggest leverage on uh, Iran in this regard as well. So their uh, position becomes uh, even more uh, important because uh, the U.S. Uh, and by default the Europeans, they have all enforced um, uh, sanctions regime on Iran. So their leverage is, uh, is very small. But uh, if Iran has to get anything, as uh, the previous guest was, uh, as we were uh, speaking previously, uh, uh, jets, uh, military equipment, uh, anything of that regard, it will either go to Russia or to China. So that's why uh, Russia is very important. And uh, if the Russians uh, can influence uh, Iranian position, that would be actually uh, quite positive for uh, the whole region. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Uma, uh, for your, for your uh, uh, comment. Now, coming to you, uh, Dr. Kaab Malik, Iran historically has always been a very close ally of the Americans, sir. If you look at the history, Shah Iran, the way he was engaged with the Americans, but whatever happened after that, there was this revolution in 1979, things changed, and we all know what happened after that. But do you think in the current scenario, I mean, during these important times, how important is Iran uh, uh, for the United States of America as an ally? And what difference will it make if they are in the other camp? And especially uh, in the perspective of the current developments in the Middle East. Well, <coughs> you said, you said uh, how important is Iran as an ally of the U.S.? Well, it's not an ally, full stop. It's on the opposing camp. No, um, I said and it has been historically well, very it, close to them. Sorry? Historically, Iran was very close to the United States of America during the time of Shah Iran, post-1979, 1980, and then there was a war for another eight years, and things changed after that. Well, it's not, it's not an ally right now, and it's <coughs> 40 years, so I don't think that's going to change anytime soon unless there's some drastic change in the governance structure uh, and the type of governance in Iran, that's not going to change at all. I think Iran is fundamentally, permanently opposed to the United States for foreseeable future unless there's a drastic change mm -hmm. in the government in, in Iran. So, so it is going to try as, as a country, it's a smaller country, much smaller than the United States. It's going to try to balance off U.S. pressure with allying itself with China and uh, Russia and projecting that power, in essence, uh, into the Middle East where it wants to influence. Um, for example, you mentioned a $400 billion deal. Actually, uh, the fact of the matter is that these numbers uh, are a fallacy. They, they don't exist. The, the, the agreement last year, the strategic agreement between China and uh, Iran, had no quantitative facets to it, meaning it did not mention uh, numbers of, uh, or amounts of money. And this has been qualified by both the foreign ministry in Iran and these, um, the Chinese foreign spokesperson. So they said that there is no monetary uh, quantitative established numbers to this deal. It is more a shoring up of understanding between the two countries. Um, and China in itself is playing uh, the larger game as a direct strategic competitor to, to the United States. And in doing so, is going to want to find a number of allies, a number of relationships around the region and elsewhere to counter U.S. Um, influence. Uh, Iran is just one of them. It's not 
profoundly overarching and in significance uh, as, a, uh, as its relationship with Pakistan as well, or even the relationship that the Chinese have with Saudi Arabians, which is substantially bigger as far as monetary concerns are, uh, because of the, the, the amount of um, oil and gas shipped um, or transported to uh, uh, China because it's, uh, it's an energy dependent country. Um, and it's not a supplier, you see. So, so China is trying to balance off lots of different facets around the world, and Iran is just one of them. When it comes to Iran, I mean, Saudi Arabia is still the biggest China supplier of oil to partner. Chinese. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm saying Saudi Arabia is still the major supplier of uh, energy resources to China. That's what I'm saying. So, what I'm saying is that Iran may be uh, touted as being a very large, significant and strategic shift in relationship, but it's not. This agreement between the Chinese and Iran isn't that significant. It is just following on from established relationships, putting it into writing, and more an outline of potential goals in the future, as opposed to definitive investment from the Chinese. And they're watching carefully. The Chinese are still watching Iran primarily because they don't want to be subject to sanctions. Uh, from the Americans can oppose similar sanctions and uh, and use this particular situation with Iran to uh, negotiate with them to to impose sanctions on furthering sanctions on uh, China, which they do not want. So I think the Chinese are being very careful with their relationship with Iran. They're not putting billions of dollars into infrastructure development. That was just an understanding, but there's nothing concrete made. They're not putting billions of dollars into arms shipments into Iran. That was just an understanding that there could be a potential for this. So I think what's happened is that the, the, the relationship, the agreement that was made last year in the spring was uh, touted and highlighted and hyped more so than it was, especially by certain parties that were, against, that were against both China and Iran, to make the hardliners in the West uh, try to shift policy to become more anti Iranian and anti-Chinese, especially because of uh, um, Israel's particular dislike of uh, Iran, because it's a major competitor to uh, Israeli influence in the Middle East. Um, so I think I think what we've got to be careful about is to listen to the media reports everywhere, to think that these are definitive without looking at the details. This number you know, 400 billion that you were talking about was actually a falsified report ma made in uh, 2019, which has been taken off the internet altogether, so that that's basically been invalidated altogether. So this number sticks in the in the the information sphere, but it actually doesn't exist at all. All right, but one other important factor, sir, if you remember, <clears throat> uh, uh, during the mid of uh, January, uh, the Iranian Foreign Minister, Mr. Hossein Amir Abdullahian, uh, he also visited um, China, and they did talk about increase in the trade and uh, also they have talked about the security and perhaps one important uh, issue was about the COVID-19. So that engagement is still there. Don't you see that that is pro a productive step? Well, no, I, I do agree. I, I think this is a follow-on agreement. I think, I think the relationship is becoming strengthened. I don't, I don't see that there's going to be any real change in that. But there, you've got to remember that Chinese are a global player. Iran is a regional player. China will choose partners that is, serves its own interest, and it will choose partners based on the economic value and future potential that these relationships may have for, for the Chinese, and especially in relation to the competition with the United States. So the Chinese um, will be choosing Iran and put the investment into Iran based on the stability of that relationship, but also they're very cognizant. They recognize that the uh, comprehensive uh, action plan, the, the plan of action that they had uh, was actually uh, not there anymore in real terms because the United States is out of it. Now, if the United States comes back into the deal, then the Chinese are more likely to invest further into Iran, primarily because they will be uh, will no longer have the threat of sanctions on them as well. And you got to appreciate that the companies, Chinese companies, uh, will be independently investing. So they, they fear in sanctions on themselves because the Americans will impose sanctions on those individual companies that the Chinese can do nothing about at this moment in time. So nobody's really going to rush into Iran yet right now. Uh, the Chinese are waiting to see how this relationship develops. And actually, they want uh, an agreement to take place 
and similar to the to the Russians who want the agreement to foment a bit more bilateral or multilateral cooperation between the different countries, especially the United States. They want the Americans to come into this. I don't think anybody wants a conflict in this environment at all, but people are waiting. So, for example, <clears throat> the Americans, they end up agreeing that fine, we will, uh, you know, restore the previous status, we'll work on it. And uh, at the same time, this is what you need to, obviously, they said that, you know, you can't enrich this to a certain level. Um, there has to be a certain amount of centrifuges to be enriched. And then how to make sure uh, that they are not used for the military purposes, rather they are just for the civilian purposes. Good enough, sir. And then the, at the same time, if I remember a similar uh, talk was going on and the Iranians very clearly said that, you know, you can place your people and keep an eye. So it seems that, you know, there is going to be some sort of a negotiation, perhaps not as good as Mr. Jawad Zarif did, but still uh, something is going to go forward. Uh, over here, sir, do you think that in such a case where there is an agreement, there's going to be more influence of the Americans or the Iranians? Uh, through other means or, or because the Americans have their presence in their, in, their, in their own sea, I would say, sir, in the Gulf. Whereas the, uh, you know, the issue regarding the Russians, they could be under sanctions or the Chinese could be under sanctions. And they have been declared, these three countries, Russia, China and Iran have been declared the three major adversaries of United Kingdom. Whereas the USA says that Russia and China are our two major adversaries. So you can well imagine two countries are common other than Iran, that is Russia and China. How do you see this equation now? Because sir, it seems that in Europe, especially after the Brexit issue, uh, the UK is taking a lot of decisions uh, on their own. And uh, I mean, uh, European countries are not much involved in that. So especially, I mean, if you look at the statements, the recent statements of the G7 countries, sir. Well, it all depends on how this agreement finally pans out. If it is similar to the agreement of 2015 and slowly Iran is opened up uh, for trade and investment, then there's, if there's money to be made, all these countries would be vying for contracts over there. China obviously has a competitive edge and China having had an older relationship uh, with no acrimony at any point uh, would stand to gain an advantage. Also, China, China's policy looks ahead 50 to 60 years. Uh, in the near future, uh, in the next uh, few decades, the importance of oil is going to continue to diminish because a lot of cars in Europe and North electric. America are going to be electric. Then a lot of alternative energies are going to be developed. Uh, so the importance of oil is going to diminish. But as far as the geostrategic position of Iran is concerned, nobody can change that. Nobody can as challenge that either. <laughs> yes. And as far as China is concerned, uh, their one belt, uh, one road initiative, uh, Iran could play a very major role in that because the access to, to Europe and European markets uh, could be very easily facilitated through Iran, which, which if you were to go from the north uh, would entail uh, greater challenges in terms of weather and terrain. So if you were to take a link through Iran, uh, because of the better weather and better terrain, uh, they can be a better partner in, in a communication link, whether it is uh, roads, whether it's railways, and whether it's oil pipelines. So that will continue to be there. But as far as uh, one is not sure how much of Iran uh, will be opened. Uh, as far as Russia and uh, China, you were talking about sanctions. I don't think that the United States is in a position uh, to put those sanctions unless uh, something falls apart vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Ukraine. Then the international community, I'm pretty sure, uh, are going to exert some sort of pressure. Will, will mm -hmm. exert tremendous pressure. Uh, on Russia. Because in the, right. in, in the Ukrainian issue, sir, uh, Vladimir Putin is not backing out. One thing mm -hmm. is for sure. This man means business and he has very clearly, in fact, uh, 
told his counterparts that, see, this could happen. This could lead to a full-fledged war. I mean, he has also landed his forces in Belarus. Yes, but you see, their concerns are that the expansion of NATO, NATO is creeping closer and closer Towards to East. Moscow. And, and they want an assurance uh, that Ukraine will not be included in NATO, whereas none of the European or the Americans are willing to give that assurance. They don't see the rationale behind it, and, and they do want to. But the, the important thing is, will there be a point at which uh, Russia will actually send forces into the Ukraine? That would be a very serious issue. And that would have some serious repercussions for Russia, including sanctions and possibly some kind of military conflict. Uh, so recently, the British, uh, they gave those anti-tank uh, missile system. They said that it's a defensive system uh, to the Ukrainians. And at the same time, you know, when uh, the, uh, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, said that you are actually putting all these in my porch. <laughs> you remember that. Uh, so that is something to worry about. So one important and last question, and that is, what if this JCPOA deal is cancelled? Do you think then the Iranian leadership will start looking towards East? I mean, they have this look towards East policy also. Well, God forbid that it is cancelled. Uh, they will survive the way they have been doing since 2018. That's a different uh, question altogether. Uh, but uh, Iran is very, very keen, and so is the Biden administration. So there is, in my opinion, there are certain points. Uh, each side wants to take maximum advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm quite hopeful that things will work out. In case, in case they do not, uh, things will continue the way they've been doing for the last three or four years. The same continuation, that is what we can see. But anyway, uh, thank you very much, uh, no Nazsab, for your presence. It was a pleasure having you, uh, Dr. Akab Malik, in, in the show. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Omar Karim uh, for his uh, contribution as well. And that's all we have for this. Uh. I'll see you tomorrow, inshallah. Till then, you take good care. Khudafis.